the SWIC program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice at the University of San Francisco acknowledges our presence on the unceded land of the indigenous Ohlone communities and pays our respect to these traditional caretakers and elders, past, present, and emerging. It is our intention that this acknowledgement plays a role, however infinitesimal, in a much larger process of confronting the past in order to create a not yet realized future rooted in justice. Welcome everyone to the first event of the USF SWIC Program of Jewish Studies and Social Justice 2019-20 academic year. Now the where tonight we will learn with Rabbi Lee Bicell, where he will speak with us about his new book, Refugees in America, Storage, Stories of Courage, Resilience, and Hope in Their Own Words. My name is Aaron Han Tapper, and it's my honor and privilege to direct this cutting edge program. Let me begin by thanking a number of people for their support for making this event possible. <clears throat> Thank you to all SWIG, JSSJ faculty and staff, Thank you to the Department of International Studies and the Department of Theology and Religious Studies for co-sponsoring this event. I'd like to take a very brief moment to tell you about our SWIG JSSJ program. Founded in 1977, our program is the first Jewish studies chair or program at a Catholic university on the planet Earth. In 2008, we were reestablished. Yeah, you can laugh. In 2008, we were reestablished as a SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice, the first academic program worldwide to formally link Jewish Studies with Social Justice. Including a minor in this field in the classroom, our program offers a wide range of significant Jewish Studies courses not found in other educational settings. Beyond the classroom, we offer extraordinary events that are free and open to the public, such as tonight's event. Let me briefly tell you about the other events we have upcoming this semester. Two weeks from tonight, or actually two weeks from today, on September 24th from 1 to 2 in McLaren Hall. More information about all this is on a very large 11 by 17 piece of paper over there. We will learn with USF recently retired Hebrew professor Esti Sklut, who will speak about her new memoir, Uprooted, a Memoir of a Marriage. On Thursday, October 3rd from 6.30 to 8 in Fromm Hall's Berman Room, we will learn with Professor Shana Hammerman, one of our USF JSSJ faculty, who will discuss her latest book, Silver Screen Hasidic Jews, The Story of an Image. On Thursday, October 17th, in, uh, on Tarantino Plaza, which is the plaza behind McLaren, and at the, if you go through Malloy, um, nobody here knows the name of, the, of that, but it's called Tarantino Plaza, so that's some trivia for you. Um, we're hosting the Cosmic Diaspora Trio Band on that evening, Thursday, October 17th. They bring together experimental poetry, jazz, and klezmer music in an eclectic, fluid, and improvised manner. That integrates science fiction, Jewish mysticism, exilic and immigrant experience, and myth and ritual. On Thursday, November 7th, from 6.30 to 8 in this room, we will have our fifth annual human rights lecture titled Climate Change, Disability, and the Politics of Survival with Rabbi Julia Watts Belzer, an associate professor of Jewish studies at Georgetown, a disability activist, and an advocate for queer and gender justice. Finally, the last event of the semester will be on November 14th uh, in another room in from towards the entrance to this building. Our event will be Jews of Uganda, and we'll be learning with the chief rabbi of Uganda, Rabbi Gershom Suzomi. Again, if you'd like more information about our, about our work in general, there's some green booklets over there about our events this semester in particular. Uh, you can also sign up for our list there. We send out about one email a month about these events. Through the SWIG JSSJ program, we believe that education is the best long-term way to create systemic change. Whether one has the time to take a semester-long course or a mere few hours to hear from a single speaker, Education is fundamental to making our world better, paramount in shining the spotlight on the margins, on the oppressed communities who are mistreated merely because of their race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, sex, or any other social identity under the sun. Now let me introduce tonight's event formally. Our guest speaker tonight will take us down the path of refugees in America. Though his intention with his new book is to tell the story of 11 recent refugees now living in America in their own words, he explicitly wants to focus on these individuals and their profound stories of courage 
let me share a little bit about Rabbi Baisel, Lee, myself. So at least you'll know a little bit more about this amazing human being. Lee is a humanitarian activist, a rabbi, a teacher, an author, and he works with the JSSJ faculty as our Sinton Visiting Professor of Holocaust, Ethics, and Refugee Studies. He has visited refugee camps in Darfur, Chad, South Sudan, Rwanda, Kenya, Ethiopia, Haiti. He has written extensively about the plight of refugees and has secured much needed funding for medical clinics in many refugee camps in these countries. He has been involved in civic activities throughout his career, focused on trying to make life better for the most vulnerable. Currently, he's a senior moderator at the Aspen Institute. He previously worked with such renowned not-for-profit organizations such as the Redford Center and International Medical Corps, holding senior positions. In 2014, he was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve on the board of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum position he held through April 2019. He's an engaging speaker, addressing issues related to genocide, refugees, ethics, and a variety of other subjects. Perhaps most relevant to our USF community, he also teaches two courses on campus, starting up again next fall, but we offer them this semester and next, Holocaust and Genocide and Refugees, Justice, and Ethics. Lee's an integral member of the SWIG JSSJ program, having played a foundational role in our progress toward becoming one of the more important Jewish studies programs in the country, working on issues related to social justice. Though we're not really welcoming Lee, but we're just having him back on campus because he's been here for almost a decade. Please well, join me in welcoming Rabbi Lee Baisel. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Even in the back, you can hear okay? Terrific. How, how many of you have ever taken classes with me before? Good. Uh, yeah. A minus, right? No. A, A, and uh, A, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't these, anybody else? And, yeah, that's right. Many years ago. Um, Aaron, I want to thank you for the wonderful introduction. Professor Von Tapper, and I just want to comment on one thing he did, because it connects to everything we're going to do tonight. Get ready, okay? And um, he made a little statement, right, which is now on all of our uh, emails that we send out from the SWIFT program about the land that we sit on here. And when we talked about that with Native Americans, I was thinking of Faulkner, and I'm not going to cite Faulkner was a American uh, Nobel laureate, great writer, one of the great writers of the 20th century. And he said something about the past is never dead, it's always with us. I'm not paraphrasing it exactly, I'm saying paraphrasing it. We make such a difference in life in the little things we do. And just having that statement at the beginning of the program sets a tone. He's not offering a solution, he didn't give a proposal, but he was mindful that at one point, who dwell on this land? What was their story? Who were they? That's for you and me to learn from. But Aaron, I want to thank you for your leadership in that and for all you've done here. It's been it is an honor to work with you. And all of my colleagues that are here tonight, I'm not going to go through and name everybody because I may miss somebody, but I'm thrilled to be here. So let's start. Refugees, you know that was in the title. Nobody came for extra credit tonight, right? Okay, good. Those for extra credit, you know, it's four hours. We start now, we end about 10.30. Uh, no, just joking. Don't worry. I honor time. People study with me. I have to use humor to, to survive. So I need you to be honest. Just, I want you to be raw, honest in every way like you are in your classes. When you hear the refugee, the word refugee, in today's world, what comes to your mind and what do you think comes to other people's mind? We're not going to quote other people, we're not going to say them by name, but the word refugee in 2019, on this date, September 10th, 2019, when we use the word refugee, what are some of the meanings it has? Yes. People from the Middle East. Yes. Um, escaping some type of violence. Escaping some type of violence. Excellent. Yes. Cages on the southern border. Cages on the southern border. 
How are some of the people labeled refugees? What's the language out in our political jargon? You, you know it. Come on, don't be embarrassed. Say it. What's the language out there? Wall. Walls. We're going to build a wall. What else? Draining our resources. Bad people, criminals, right, invading our country. Muslims might even be coming here. God forbid. I mean, it's Muslims or bad people and criminals. Yes. Uh, they're going to take our jobs away, right? So there's, yes. Deportation. Deportation is on the mind of a lot of people. Absolutely. From shithole countries. From shithole countries. Okay, to quote somebody. Um, it's true. There's a lot of negative and positive image. For me, as uh, Professor Han Tapper said so well, I wanted to bring 11 people to life. Because here's my ultimate goal. I believe until I give you the end at the beginning. I want to go beyond the political rhetoric and the demonizing of this issue to the ethical issues, to the human issues, to how we relate to refugees on a personal basis. This isn't a class tonight. Not like we're not going to have a quiz. We're not going to have any of that kind of stuff. We're not going to go into definitions of what. You can ask me later if you want. I'm happy to talk with you. What are the asylum seekers? But I want to do something different and look at some of the values. So I want to start with me. 2004, kind of transition year in my life, and I heard a little bit on the radio about the start of the genocide in Darfur. And I think that whole year they say in 2003. It was about 10 minutes on radio or TV, hardly anything. It really hit me, kind of what the, the correspondent was talking about. We went home and talked with my wife that night. And I talked about that we weren't alive during the Holocaust, but let me just put it bluntly, the world stood by while the Holocaust took place, including America. I was very much alive during Rwanda, the dean of a school in LA, um, two sons, and I, Levi Sell, did nothing during the Rwandan genocide, which unfolded in a hundred days. Now, people like to blame President Clinton. He's taking real responsibility because if he had jammed the radio waves, we would have saved thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives. Probably half the people would have survived. But I never like to blame anyone else. Why didn't I act? Why didn't I make call one congressperson or one senator? Why didn't I donate to a humanitarian agency? And that led me, long story short, to make my first journey in 2004 with this group, International Medical Corps, that uh, Aaron mentioned. They're the American version of Doctors Without Borders, and most people don't know their name because they're not political. They won't label something genocide. They've chosen they'd rather be in doing the medical work on the ground feeding people, helping people in refugee camps, then labeling something. Both groups do great work. They just play different roles. So in the fall of 04, I spent two weeks in refugee camps in Eastern Chad. Beginning earlier, I was interested in the human story. And here I'll just say a parenthetical note that will delve in. Every one of you here tonight, you come in with your own story. I have the privilege that I wrote this book, and I get to talk a little bit tonight, and I get to do that. Every one of you has an exceptional story. Part of why I like to tell stories is I want us to find better ways of uplifting our stories, of who you are, what your family of origin is, what's your narrative. How did you come to this place at USF? Yeah, you're taking these classes, but who are you? So tonight, we're going to delve into this together. But first, let me go back to 2004. So this is just a little reflection. So in countries like Chad, there's hardly any paved roads. You're out in the desert, you're driving for hours and hours in those white jeeps where they really need them. They really, you know, it's sub, sub-Saharan Africa and you really need, there's so much dust and wind and everything. And after four or five hours, you start to get a sense of vertigo, of dizziness, losing your sense of where you are. And in the beginning of my book, I ponder, how is it that back in 2004, and I still think about it every day, and we all know it, but how far we've advanced scientifically, medically, technologically, right? Have we advanced humanly? And here I reflect a little bit on that experience. 
and I put this in the following way. I gaze out into the desert. I think I see a boy walk out from a wadi, a dry riverbed, holding a tin cup and extending it out. We are moving at a very rapid pace. The desert is filled with deep crevices, and the ride shakes you to your core, and you lose a sense of what is real and what is imagined. But as we pass, I see that indeed it is a boy, a young boy, maybe 10 years old, dressed in rags. I want to ask the driver to stop. I really do. Yet all I do is look as we speed by. I'll never forget that moment. That boy haunts me. Actually, it is my conscience that haunts me. Why did I not insist that we stop? Why did I not give that boy some water for his cup, hold his hand, offer a little hope, let him know that the world does care, that I care for this anonymous refugee boy out looking for firewood? And I often like to think about it, and I write it in here. Who knows? Well, first of all, who knows what happened to that boy? And who knows, maybe one day, just like all the little girls out there, all the little boys, this could be one of them that will come up with the cure for cancer. Or figure out how we can finally live together in peace, right? Or how we can make a lot of things in our society better. Maybe it's going to be one of them. So in these 11 stories, I focused on 11 different people. Range of ages from early 20s, to uh, mid 90s, uh, I think there's six women and five men, or six men and five. Yeah, exactly, there's six and five. They live all over the United States: Grand Rapids, Michigan, Atlanta, Georgia, Houston, Texas, L.A., San Diego, Bay Area, um, all in the states. The commonality is they all made it to America. And what we're going to look at tonight are three themes, and I, I want you to think about these themes as we kind of go through. Courage, hope, and resilience. That's not just a nice name that I decided to put on the book. When I think about refugees and what is the quintessential, what defines the refugee experience, Hannah Arendt, the famous Jewish philosopher, and if in one of your classes you can look at what, how she describes this, she writes a brilliant passage in an essay called We Refugees. As refugees, we lost everything, she said. We lost our history, we lost our language, we lost our culture, we lost our people, we lost a sense of familiarity. We lost everything, and we had to make our way to a new life. Resilience, courage, and hope I see in everyone in this book and probably in every refugee I've ever met. But tonight we're going to look at three of them and hear a little bit of their words. So, Two things about my book I want to share with you. I was asked this the other night. Are all refugees like this? Are, are we all alike? We all have a connection to the US. Are, are we all alike? I, I don't think so. Are, are the three of you all alike? I mean, you know each other? Yeah, are you all alike, exactly alike? Some differences, right? Okay. We're all different. The only thing, and I'm happy to ask you questions about this later, that's skewed in my book or any book like this, I got to people who were willing to speak with me. Very hard in some cases. Certain cultures, very hard to break into. Cambodian and Vietnamese cultures tend to be private, very hard to earn trust, and, but it all worked out. But I'll tell you who's not in the book. Those refugees who are suffering. Those refugees who have not made it to America, or those refugees that came here and are still suffering so much trauma and depression and anxiety that they would never want to tell their story. So I think of them tonight as we gather here and we listen to parts of three stories. I think of them very, very pointed. The other thing, and Aaron was so helpful in my writing of the book, and many people gave suggestions and input, and I digested it all. And you can see there's some books back there that, by the way, they're $25 if you want to buy one tonight, or there's a place through Rutgers you can get a 30% discount. So if you want to take that flyer with you, is that, as Aaron said beautifully, I'm telling their stories. So rather than a bunch of quotes and looking like that, is their passages are centered and in the middle in italics. Their story is what it's about. I'm just the connector. That's what I do here. I'm the connector. 
And so tonight we're gonna to meet three people, Miran Samadar, um, Asinja Bedell, and Sidonia Lax. So first, I want you to meet Marin Samadar. Any of you know Marin, by the way? So a couple people here do know Marin. And let's see what's happening here. Those are my grand, three of my grandparents. <coughs> They're all very nice. Jesus. That was a joke. Um, um, my five dollar glasses just broke. <laughs> 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 That's the um, There's only no stumble people out there. We see you around there. Oh, oh, it is. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll send the bill. Marin Samadar. Okay. So let's start with Marin. Marin was born in the country of Eritrea. And I picked Marin tonight to bring out and highlight the value of hope. How powerful hope is. So most of us don't know, know very little about Eritrea. If I were to say, when we think of the refugee crisis, you would name the countries in the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, you would talk about Syria. There's a variety of places we might talk about, right? But we could spend the next hour here. I don't think it would take a long stretch to come up with Eritrea. So Eritrea, and what I do at the beginning of each chapter, in two pages, I set a context of where they come from, where the person. So it's ordered by Sudan, very tough place, Ethiopia, approximately about five and a half million people, combined Christians and Muslims who get along well. It was been under the rule of many people, Italy, um, then Britain, and then Ethiopia, annexed territory. There's seats up here, by the way, and there's nothing wrong. It's nice up here, and really your teachers will like it, and might get extra, extra, extra credit. Um, and what happens often in countries where they've lived under other powers rule, they get their sovereignty, and sometimes you get people like um, Alforki, is his name, President Alforki in, in Eritrea, who led the revolution, and then since 1993, he's become president for life. And um, so Marin's story is set in a country that's been at war, all kinds of battles, everything like that. So he starts in his talking. Can you hear me without the mic? Is that, can you hear me okay? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna knock you some for a while because the glasses, the mic, everything like that, I need to hold the book for a while. So I might have to borrow someone's glasses. Um, Marin is born in a country at war. He grows up with his mom. And early on he talks about that they moved from one city to another where they would be safer. A trip that would take three days normally. So somewhere, let's think of where we take a three-day trip to on a bus, maybe Montana or something, I'd take a couple days on a bus or whatever. It took them nine months. And he shares the whole story of what happens, makes it very real. But in this one passage, and this is from a young age, and again, a very common theme. But sometimes, again, I learn so much from these people, I have to tell you about education, about everything like this. He talks about the role of education. His parents never went to college. And this is Marin's words now, when they moved to the new town, or back to another town. They moved several times. It was very hard to adjust. We had been living in a very open-minded place, and then we moved to a very conservative society. But my parents, although not well educated, they knew how education could transform life. It is them who instilled the love of learning and the great value of education in my life. So, this notion of learning, education, self-improvement. But like everyone his age in Eritrea, at the age of 17, you are taken into the military and it is life conscription, basically, until you get to be old like me and then you're released or something. But it could be 30 years, it could be 50 years, it could be 25 years, you serve in the military. And here we start to get into the lens of the trauma, the experience that many go through. So here's Marin again. The first six months, we accepted the military training. There's a lot of punishment, but we were kind of okay with it. But when school started, that treatment didn't change. It started, for the younger ones, they let them go to school too. Unexpectedly, they would tie your hands. At times, we were told to stand in the sun. 
um, in extreme heat without moving for half an hour or an hour. People would drop to the ground fainting, or they would tell you just to get on the ground, make you crawl, and beat you with sticks. They tied my hands to my legs behind me. My face was on the ground, hands and tie, legs tied by my bed curtain on a hot, hot sunny day in the open air. And actually, when he does come into my classes and share, you may remember this, he shows an image of somebody hogtied, but he never talks about it as being him. There's only, and, but privately and sharing in the book, people share a lot more. But the degradation, this is just one story of many. I had to select, obviously, only a number of things. I wanted the book to only be about 200 pages. So the degradation that Marin went through, but he had a sense of hope. Another piece of information about Marin. He estimates his father died, I think, when Marin was 12, in one of the wars with Ethiopia, that in his entire life, Marin spent 30 days with his father. 30 days, that was it. Broken up, a day here, two days there, three days here, so really never knew his father. So he's living with this life in the military, total degradation, and with no hope, because we're playing off the value of hope, right? And he knows he's got to get out. And they show them all these films about people trying to escape from Eritrea, uh, from the military, who get shot at the border with Sudan. Because they want to get to Sudan, and they they'll get to a refugee camp there and use that as a way to get um, refuge somewhere else. He goes home to see his mother. He cannot tell her about this, because to share it with her would place her in great danger and himself in great danger. Ultimately, he learned, he left with two friends. It was a couple day journey to Sudan, never knowing they were going to be shot, caught. They met many people on the road who had been injured and wounded. They get to a refugee camp in Sudan. Now, one of the things that Marin talks about is the following. Marin is a very reflective person. My glasses. Did anybody use 1.50? I need an older crowd for that when I teach it for the front. Page 26, sorry, kind of weird. You know, you get by. Um, page 26, okay. So this is Marin now. I'm going to jump ahead. This is Sudan, refugee camp. He's lucky enough to have an uncle in South Africa. He happens to get able to get hold of him. The uncle, people help other people. Wires money. He's able to get to Khartoum, the capital of Sudan. From there, he goes to Libya, then Mozambique, and then ultimately to South Africa. He starts studying. He's working in a restaurant, like many of you, day and night, between holding jobs, going to school, all that. And he shares this. I started to question myself a lot. It was like, yeah, I'm lucky. I got the chance to study and to get paid, but there were a lot of people dying every day. They might have been, that might have been my fate because people have a network of hearing what's happening back in Eritrea. There's communication all around this world, as we all know. We have and people have access in refugee camps to cell phones and everything, mm -hmm. like that. And I think it took I took it very personally, and I started asking myself things. What can I do? At some point, I remember asking all sorts of people, why is it like this? What does life mean? Any of you ever wondered that? Probably, right? What does life mean? Um, I started asking psychiatrists, professors, pastors, you name it, all sorts of people who might have a better understanding about the meaning of life, and there wasn't anyone who could give me something tangible, something I wanted to hear. Now, I'll leave it to you to ponder, the reader, the listener tonight, to ponder, do you think a man like that wanted to hear while he's in South Africa now, studying and working, and he does see a future now, by the way. He's being applauded by many people, he sees a future for himself, but he's connecting to all those who weren't as lucky. Lucky is another critical element in most of these stories. So Marin's reflecting on the meaning of life. So just to give you also, in all these stories, and every other seats up here, please, every, please come up. Every refugee story I've ever, ever known in my life, luck is a part of it, and knowing what to do with that luck is the key element. And I think it's, again, a lesson for all of us. We get lucky, do we know what to do with that luck? 
So Marin, very reflective. Ultimately, he gets invited to come here to the States to give a talk on the East Coast about the crisis in Eritrea, but he's not sure he can get out of South Africa. And here again is the story of luck. He talks about meeting a man in a coffee shop one night in an airport who worked at another airport, and the man told him, you know, listen, Marin, it's very hard to get out of the country. We don't always honor visas and for your papers, and there's a lot of corruption, so don't get your hopes that you'll ever get out. So then Marin shared with me, I got in line to board the flight for the conference, and I approached the official with great trepidation. I realized all of a sudden that it was the same guy who told me that you have to be lucky. It was the same guy, and he was laughing at me. I was laughing at him, and he looked at me and said, you see how small the world is? And then he said to me, but don't forget me when you become a big leader. And he stamped my visa. Go, he said. It just happened. I never even bought this guy a cup of coffee. So Marin comes to America, comes to the East Coast, gives his talk, and decides that the future in South Africa isn't what he wants, and that he can have a better future here. Ends up coming out here to the West Coast, and in all of Marin's journeys, which is also very common, that any refugee, if you didn't budget here, thank you for coming, can tell you, is that you have to be very patient. Things take a long time. In America, we kind of, very, things are very quick. Of, when am I going to graduate? When does school start? When does the year end? There's tremendous patience involved. He ends up coming out here, there's a lot to the story, and he gets into the University of San Francisco. He gets a master's degree from Human Rights. And December 2016, he's the first refugee to ever give the graduation speech. And it was a talk I will never forget. And you could hear a pin drop. He started it when he got up by presenting to President Fitzgerald the international flag of the refugee. President Fitzgerald had one of his colleagues come up. They opened it up, and there on the main stage in the church was the international flag of the refugee. And Marin shared about five minutes worth of um, thoughts that night, that day. They were all very poignant. And he says um, the following. This is the heart of it. It is not an easy road, but hope is the oxygen of my life. It's not an easy road, but hope is the oxygen of my life. And then he went on to say, and I have hope in humanity. A man who went through what I shared with you, and much, much more, that just scratches the surface of the agony, the trauma. He's able to go on, and hope is, is the oxygen. Those of you who know Marin can speak to that, right? This is a man filled with hope. Graduates in December of 16, the whole world is going to be great, and the reality sets in. He's not yet a citizen. God willing, that will happen in December of this year. God willing, there's a lot of issues involved, but hopefully it will all work out, and these are times where everyone who's not a citizen has to worry greatly. Will their application be honored, and he's done everything right? Graduates, He's not sure what he wants to do, but ultimately decides he eventually wants to go to law school. Because one thing he needs is money. Drives a taxi for a while, drives a lift for a while, has other jobs, work for an immigrant's rights attorney in Berkeley, um, does a lot of things. And now he's studying for the LSAT, and he hopes to be in a law school next year. He has tremendous focus and determination, and the thing that I've really learned and really comes out in Marin Samadar's life is the notion of hope. That once he was given a window of hope, right in South Africa, and able to come here, that window of hope opened a door of a life. And he's willing to walk through that, no matter what the price, no matter how long it takes him. But I would tell you for anyone who's a refugee, right? you know, my friend, dear friend from Rwanda here, is that psychologically, and we only heard one story, I'm not here to tell you horror stories so you don't need to hear them, you can watch TV and hear better horror stories, but to be hogtied in the hot sun with your face in the ground, <laughs> that doesn't feel very good. And to go through the other degradation he did, but yet, you can see it in his face, let me just go back here for a second, for a second. 
Oh, is it? Oh, it's up there. I mean, look at that. That's Mary. So now we're going to go on. Hold on one second. Just do this so I can see it. Now I want you to meet a Sinja. Did it come up? Okay. A Sinja Bedell. She was born in a little province in Iraq. And I don't think I have to tell you a lot about Iraq. You're all kind of familiar with it. The main objective in Iraq was to get rid of Saddam Hussein, and that's part of the part of her background. But Asinja, and you can see her eyes here in the photographer I work with, was just brilliant of capturing the soul of a person. For me, Asinja um, represents resilience. Of all the things she's had to go through as a woman, growing up in a very male-dominated society, a woman with dreams, a smart woman, and a woman who happens to be part of the Yazidi religion. Now, we have labeled the genocide by ISIS against the Yazidis as a genocide. The Yazidis are a small, ancient religion, and, um, should I use it? Okay, true, okay, thanks. Sorry about that, I hope you can all hear me now. So she's Yazidi, and I'm not gonna give you a whole long talk about Yazidis tonight, but they are hated by many groups, and they're wonderful people, and their beliefs are just different, just like we have different beliefs. So she um, was born in March 19, 1983, in a little village called Bashika. I don't know if that's in your book at all, but she was born in a little village called Bashika. She grew up like many Yazidi girls, and they all, by the way, and Marin talks about this in my lengthy interviews with him, and it's in his story. Everyone here has a mentor or someone that played a role in their life. Asinja talks about her grandfather. So let me, um, and you may, some of you may remember a number of years back, it was when um, uh, I think Obama was president, that uh, there were 40 to 50,000 Yazidis trapped on Mount Sinjar and they were all gonna die, they were being pressed by ISIS, and we bombed the bottom and they were able to flee, but they were still being persecuted, and Asinja has been through all that. So she talks about her grandfather at an early age, living in this little village, and I'll come back to the microphone, let me just get the page here. Um, okay, hold on one second. Okay. Asinja speaking. My grandfather would tell us stories. I kept them in my mind because forgetting what happened is exactly what they want for us to disappear quickly. Now there again, you know, a lot of people ask about my interviewing style. I push when I need to, and I leave a lot of things just be. Was she talking about being a Zidi, being an educated woman? What's she talking about here? The people of Iraq that the world seems to have forgotten about and the context of what happened in Iraq. So she tells the story of being one of eight children growing up. And this is from the time she's a young woman, she grew up in the horrors of Saddam Hussein and listen to her words. We all live in fear of him and what he might do at any time. He kept the Iraqi people isolated from the world. Anyone who dissented was killed. And again, those four words, or anyone who dissented was killed, that's uh, five words. That's an abstract thought here tonight. But there are people in this room who know the reality of that in whatever countries they are, that when you dissent, you are killed. Now, that's not what we think of here in America. We may dissent, we may uh, go on a march in D.C. or Cleveland or Missouri or San Francisco, but we don't think we're going to get killed. It does happen. I mean, tragically, it does happen, even here but not like it does in places like Iraq, where she talks a lot that you just accept death as part of life. But at the time, I was a kid learning English and watching Oprah. So even in her little village, yeah, they did have TV, and you get that kind of stuff, right? Um, because she talked, and I just listened, and I loved the topics she was talking about. 
Then when I reached high school, both my grandfather and father thought that I was ready to read books they were reading. So listen to this. Just imagine being a Yazidi girl in a high school in this little village and having to hide that you're Yazidi, by the way, because the community doesn't really want to know that you are. Um, the first I read was Gone with the Wind. And I read it again in Arabic because I was worried I missed something. Then, Love in the Time of Cholera. How many of you have read that? Okay, so a few people. Um, I've read it once. It's not an easy read. I mean, it's a very famous read. Everyone, you know, always want to say, oh, yeah, Marquez, Love in the Time of Cholera. But the truth is, we really don't read it. We just refer to it. I'm just joking. There are people, like some of my colleagues, who probably really know it well. But it's no easy book. She reads it in her second language as a high school young woman. Um, Marquez, listen to this. this really good. Uh, uh, Mar Marquez transformed me from the reality of my life to his story. There were a lot of times I didn't like this life, the one she was living, in this place where I was so limited, not like the Western girls my age who were traveling, doing a lot of things that I couldn't do. I saw a lot of barriers to my life because I watched movies like Rain Man, and I learned English, read books, and tried to isolate myself from the life here in Bashika and just be and just be part of the Western world. I wanted to educate myself, and the only window I had was through arts and movies. That's why they called me the imagining imaginary girl. Then she wants to go to college. But in Yazidi culture, like many cultures like that, it's really not seen that a woman would go to Baghdad and go to study. And she talks about her life being interrupted many times from her dreams of an education. And this is where resilience, and what it means to be resilient against the storms of life. We all go through storms, right? The storms in politics, the storms of culture, the storms of our own lives. And she goes through many storms. So after high school, there's a man who comes through one day, a young man working, who's her father, he um, is Yazidi, and uh, Sinja and this man get married from back then. They get married in 2001. And you all remember um, what happened tomorrow, 9-11, 2001. In 2003, we invade Iraq, thinking that's the right thing to do. We won't discuss that tonight. Um, we go in. And she talks a lot about the ruins of Baghdad. And each time she wanted to start school, one time she, the first place she got married, then they had their first kid, then the war. And she talks about Baghdad, and this is in very vivid terms, but to me it's just so um, striking. She's talking about her husband's job, and then she's talking about life in Baghdad. They killed everyone. Every day there were bombs. We actually were getting used to life with dead bodies lying on the streets. Anyone could be killed for any reason. So my friend said, this is not to scare you, this is not to torment you, I don't want to send you home with nightmares. It's what does it mean to spend one day, let alone years, in that world where you get used to dead bodies lying around you? How, how do you survive that? And I think Asinja had a resilience, and I would say her grandfather, she told me so many beautiful stories about her grandfather, and how he believed in her, even the name Asinja is not a traditional Iraqi name. We won't go into all that time. This is only the beginning of her story. Her husband's working for an American company in Baghdad. And one day they get delivered to their house a bullet in an envelope with his name on it, and saying, stop working for the Americans, or this you'll be next for this bullet. Pretty serious. They know he has to get out. There's a big explosion, by the way. He's safe. And he's able to get out and go to Istanbul. But Asinja and the two kids can't go out. And she told me, I spent about 10, 12 hours when I was down in Houston with Asinja. That's where she lives about the journey to the airport, probably like going from here to SFO, they had to try three times. And each time, 
she said, I came up with a game for the kids of, when I say hi, step down in the back seat from all the bullets around us. Finally, after many, many tries, we get to the airport and we go to Turkey. There, like many refugees, obviously she didn't speak Turkish, it took her a long time to meet anyone who spoke Arabic. It was very hard adjustment. They go to another city, not Istanbul, where they got to fill out the paperwork. Long, long struggles with uh, paperwork, organizational bureaucracy. We think we have it. It's, it's nothing compared to what they have. Then they're told they're going to be ready to leave. And then ultimately, they say, no, you're not eligible. You have to go back to this other city. And the code language is, you didn't pay the right bribes. So her husband had to leave his job. They go back. They pay the right bribes, as she put it, and they finally get on a plane to America. Now, she reflects, and again, if you try to put yourself in her shoes, um, and I'm not going to take the time to read about the whole journey out of that, yeah, it's just so powerful, it is really powerful. But um, she talks about life as a refugee, I'm going to share a few with you. I never thought I would be a refugee, and by the way, I don't think anyone ever grew up thinking they were going to be a refugee or wanted to be one. I thought I would travel just to see the world, what the girls I saw in the movies. Maybe I'd get a scholarship studying at a university. My dreams were big. So she goes on and on with that. And then she talks about an, a little incident at the Istanbul, Istanbul airport after they had gotten through customs. So they were free. They knew they were on their way to Houston at that point. And she went over to the coffee shop, and she sees a group, I forget whether it's five or six women, and she starts talking to them, and it turns out these women are friends from different parts of the states, and every year they make a trip together. They go somewhere, and that year they've gone to Turkey, the year before they've gone somewhere else. The Sinjur reflects. They were so friendly. They accepted us. And they really didn't care about what we believe, what's, what's our, what our color is, where we're from. And when I saw there were women who traveled together once a year without their husbands and have fun, I realized that could be my life and my daughter's life. As a woman in the U.S., one has choice and freedom. And again, she's sharing that view of a person who never imagined. And even though we don't have the freedoms we desire in this country, coming from that little village in Iraq and what she grew up with, and then she talks about the journey to America, coming to Houston, just to give you um, a few more things on her. The role that, how little things matter. When you ask, what can I do? Yeah, you can give money to humanitarian organizations, but here she talks about that they're in their little apartment in Houston, right? Um, our apartment had tables, chairs, a bed and blankets for us, each of my kids. There was a lot of food in the kitchen, pots and pans. We were on the second floor facing the outside. It was a beautiful view. One day a visitor came from the local church. Her name was Anne, and she said she was just a ch church member trying to find refugees to listen to them, to help them. I told her about my journey, and we cried together. And she hugged me. She prayed for me. And I told her the part that was really hurting me because I didn't have a chance to say goodbye to my parents because of the war. She couldn't do that. So she said, if you allow me, I will be your mom or your grandma here. And this woman taught Asinja about everything, about the bus system, about all the things. Because remember what about Hannah Arendt? They lose everything, all familiarity, everything you've ever known. It's about loss. And Asinja, finally, I want to give you this quote from her. And how resilient this woman is. When you have dreams and goals inside of you for a long time, it really becomes like a fuel that is hidden for the right opportunity. And once that opportunity comes, then you can distribute this fuel all around yourself to others. Sinja and her husband became citizens. She got her undergraduate degree. She's now pursuing her MBA in um, business and with a focus on leadership at Sam Houston University in Houston. And this is a woman where there's been many, many obstacles, many traumas, many horrors, but her resilience has gotten her through one of the many, many qualities. A city, let me see what time it is. And let's go on. I want you to meet one more friend of mine. 
one more person featured in this book. And these are just highlights of their stories. So let me see if this comes up. Right here. Emma. She's in her 90s. Sidonia Lux from LA. Sidonia grew up in Poland. I'm not going to give you the whole history of Poland. We don't need it for tonight. But in World War II, because of Poland's location, they had the misfortune of being between Germany and the Soviet Union. Both invaded Poland, and Poland lived through a series of wars between 1939 and 1945. And just to give you a sense, in Poland, at the beginning of the war, there were 35 million people. At the end of the war, there were about 25 million. At the beginning of the war, three and a half million Jews lived there. Three million of them died, were murdered during those six years. And then we'll talk later about other people. So Sidonia, and this is again, we tend to, sometimes we can simplify stories. Those of you who have studied with me, and I know that other people are talking about um, uh, Chinui Adichie's The Danger of a Single Story. We like to reduce other people's stories. And, you know, we have this notion of a Sidonia being a poor uh, person in Poland, came from a wealthy family. Um, and this is such a great picture for her, and I'll tell you why this picture was started. So, we lived in a very small apartment. This was in Poland. There was no running water. There was very rough wooden floors in the kitchen, a wooden burning stove. But we did have three housekeepers, one to cook, second and two to perform all the other duties. The water had to be brought in, the wood had to be chopped, the fire had to be started. And she already talked about that her family really was well off, basically. The thing that I remember very specifically, Sidonia says, is my mother's ingenuity. And again, when I think of Sidonia, you know, Mary makes me think of hope, with Sinja, I think of resilience, and with Sidonia, I think of pure, pure courage. But again, it goes back to childhood memory. My mother raised me for the future, because when I was almost eight years old, I was taught everything there was to be done in a household. Everybody got a day off, and I learned to scrub the floors with my little hands. I was crying, but that didn't matter. The doors were locked. I was a child, but that's another thing. And I couldn't come out until it was finished. I washed laundry on a scrub board and boiled sheets on the stove. And then I had to take it out, rinse it, and hang it outside to dry. I was taught how to bake bread with yeast, how to wash, clean, sew, darn. All the socks had to be darned. She talks about those are the things that saved her life. Her mother gave her a gift of life. So in early September 1939, both the Germans and the Russians, they invade Poland. Her life changes. They're ultimately taken. She's 12 years old. The parents, they try to escape. And here again, it's just a perspective. They were on their way to another country, but then she says this about her parents. Their possessions were important to them. We often think about our relationship with our possessions, right? Instead of running and getting out, because through Romania we could get to the United States or go to South America, they made a very unwise decision. And she says this in a loving way, by the way, in a loving way, to go back for a few more pillows. And that was the end of it. They never came out a lot. She spends, I think, over a year in a bunker beneath the ground. Or three months. I didn't wash. I didn't change clothes. My skin became yellow like a lemon. My hair was full of lice. There was no sunshine. So we didn't have anything to eat. And the horrors of living in a hole in the ground. And then this is was her courage and really is the core of her story and her name. At the time, she would go out during the day as a child. She'd get away with a lot of things. And I would, was eating from trash cans, leftovers. Again, that's an easy line to read from a book, right? We had a different kind of session that I'd say, let's meditate on that for half an hour. 
And some of you, by the way, may have had to do that. I don't know your dreams and all your stories. That happens right here in America. There's people eating out of trash cans tonight. But here what you have is it not being an exception to the rule, it being the rule. That's how people survive. There I was, a teenager with no vitamins whatsoever for years now. My father had heard somebody somewhere illegally had some apples for sale. He wanted in the worst way to get an apple for me. It doesn't say here we went out to find an apple for her. It's a little Sedonia. She was a little child. He never came back. And all I know is I lost my father because of an apple. Every time I eat an apple, I remember. They're in the ghetto. They find the hole. Her parents are taken away. She's taken to jail. And there she learns that the Nazis have killed her parents. She's now an orphan at 13 or 14. She goes to Auschwitz. And she talks about survival at Auschwitz and other camps as being um, what she had learned from her mother. And Sidonia is a person with outright courage. She talks about the question she had. Where was God? Why did this happen? How is it possible that little children could be killed with bayonets? Why so much evil? How could anyone commit these atrocities? I just want to say to you, my friends, I think these are the questions on all of our minds living in 2019. I wish the world was dramatically different, but that's not for tonight. But these are questions that probably we all ponder. So Julia and her, she makes her way to LA. She gets married. She and her husband start a business, and they become, I'd say, upper, upper middle class people. They have three or four kids, lots of grandchildren. But only when her husband dies does she start going out to schools to tell her stories about what it was like to grow up during the Holocaust to do all kinds of things. I just want to share um, a couple things she says and her strength of character in this. She has a great way of synthesizing and putting it. Um, so she, I asked her, why hadn't you told your story earlier, Sidonia? So we didn't want to think about what had happened. We wanted to protect the children who were simply too busy with life. Also, most people really had no interest in hearing their stories. And by the way, I'm told by almost every refugee I meet and listen to and the people love people in this book, they say, no one's ever really asked for my story. And I always say this when I'm teaching here, do we ask each other our stories? Well, we want our stories to be heard, right? And they're so appreciative that someone listens to their stories. Then I said, Sidonia, what kind of advice do you have? And this, she's great at giving advice. But part of it is so authentic, as you saw in her face and that who she is. One, learn, one has to learn how to cope no matter what life brings you. Two, always have a passport. And by the way, until the last few years, most Americans didn't have passports. It's good advice, trust me. Three, keep little things of value that can be traded for bread. That's not how most of us think, but that notion of having little things. Four, learn basic survival skills so that you can survive under any conditions. Five, learn to be physically and psychologically strong so that you can cope with anything that comes your way. Now, that's not as easy. For Sidonia, there's something, there's a courage that's built into her character that's there, and she is great with young people, by the way. She's spoken to many Jewish summer camps. She's led trips to Poland and her camp. And then she says the following. When we're deeply aware of the world and what's going on. In order to be able to stop the big fire, you have to watch for the little fires, because once they burn out of control, it's probably too late. That means keep up with the news, read the news, be active. When you see problems, get involved and stop them right at the beginning. So as you can see in these three vignettes that I've only shared a part of, I tell you, it's really impacted my life again. 
of learning from these people. It's allowed me to connect to the refugee experience in a certain kind of way. And I'll talk more about that in a minute and some questions and uh, comments. But in a sense of what does hope, courage, and resilience mean? And that we have so much to learn from the Sidonians, the Assyrians, the Marins, the thousands and millions of refugees who all have stories, and they have so much to learn from our stories. So for me in this book, I'm devoting this year going around the country to speaking and at many places engaging people in conversations of how do we go beyond the political rhetoric of refugees are bad, refugees are good, how do we enter into a discussion that's ethical and humane and respectful and listening to each other? So I want to stop here. And I'd like to take time for questions and comments, and I'll wrap it up. So uh, I open the floor to you. And, and there's no wrong question. Only the one that's not asked that you wanted to ask while you have here. So please. Who would like to go first? Uh, whoever. And speak really loud. OK? Um, and say your name so I hear it. My name's Carrie. Um, where did you find the people that you interviewed? So Carrie asked, where did I find these people? Really a journey. Um, so I have connections with Sub-Saharan Africa. And as I, because of my work there, many, many years, I know people in the humanitarian world, and I was able to, and also people fell into my life. Just the more you put yourself out, things happen. And um, a lot of communities are very hard to get in. So I'll give you... This is true of the woman from Vietnam, from Cambodia, um, other places. So I'll take the Cambodian woman. And she talks about it openly in her story, um, the following. She is the only one of the 11 really living on the edge right now. The trauma is so great of the horror she went through during the Cambodian genocide from 75 to 79 under Pol Pot and Khmer Rouge. It's raw for her. So to get to someone like that, I found an organization in Oakland called CERI, C-E-R-I, that it stands for, and they deal mostly with Cambodian refugees. Mostly it's women and men who are older, who came a long time ago, and Vietnamese boat people too, who came right after Vietnam. So I met with her social worker, who had to first kind of approve me, and that my credentials were legitimate, and their credentials do matter, that I've really been in refugee camps, that I've really done this work. Um, I think she was testing me. Am I a good listener? Uh, do I have another purpose or do I really want to tell the story? So I had to be vetted would be the right word. Then the next meeting was with the social worker and in this case, um, uh, Vanny. We met for a couple of hours and then she gave the approval and then we started the interview process that took a couple days over a couple of weeks and very complicated. She speaks beautiful English. So each person came in a different way through contacts and there were people, there were many interviews I didn't include in the book because also I realized there's a limit. 11 stories I think are reflective and there's so many other stories I wish I could have included and I feel badly that some aren't in there but that's how I got them. But getting to them probably took several months and wearing people down, calling people um, like Jawad. So Jawad is an Afghani refugee he lives in the Little Kabul section. Is anybody from Sacramento? Have you ever been, you know what the Little Kabul section is? It's a poor part of town. A lot of Afghanis living there. I got there through an organization called World Relief, a Christian relief organization. Does great work. Met with them. They liked me. They introduced me to Jawad. And I went to Jawad's apartment. And um, just to give you a sense, it, Jawad's, just very quickly, and then move on to the next question. Jawad's chapter is titled something of the Empty Walls. When I went to visit with Jawad and his wife, there's nothing on the walls. I came back and talked with my wife and I said, I want to give them stuff from her basement where we have all kinds of things to give away, but I don't want to, I don't want to do anything disrespectful culturally. And I know some about Afghani culture. I've read some, I know some Afghanis, but I don't know that much. So when I went back to visit Jawad the second time, I said, my wife and I would like to give you some gifts, you know, and I offer you the next time I come see you. He said, that's so kind of you, but Understand, we, we have things from Afghanistan that we brought. We don't want to put anything on our walls because we're told the landlord for this building, when we go to move out and we take down the blanket and there's a hole in the wall here from the nail we removed, we're going to have to pay for it and we can't afford that. So we're going to leave the walls empty. 
Our next question. Really, there's no question. Yeah, over here, please, your name. Uh, hi, I'm Zoe. Hi, Zoe. Um, I was wondering how long it took you to compile all of the stories. I suppose either that you put in the book, um, and then I also know that you have stories beyond that, and I'm just wondering how long the whole process. So how long the whole process? I would say the process started probably when I was born, and my life, my story, which is not for tonight, but really in 2004, but the real work of the book probably began three years ago with networking, and I'll just give you my sense of how I did interviews. And I have my own ground rules, and I talk to many people about interviews, which I've, I've done a lot of in my life, but never in such vulnerable situations, is that I want to be present. If I'm interviewing you, Zoe, I don't want to be taking notes because, hey, I can't read my own handwriting. So everything I tape to tape recorders, then there are services you can use to have it transcribed. So then the transcription would come to me, and then I would do the bare bones of the like, Zoe story, right? And it's your story, it's not mine. I would then send it to you with a bunch of questions like, what was the name of the village you grew up in? Because I wanted details. When people shared the name of a village, or the name of a school, or the name of that woman who was really helpful to them, they did a lot of correction, and then I did a lot of writing and reflecting, how do I bring it out? So it took about a year, a year, a year and a half of actually interviewing, writing, rewriting, reshaping, and then someone gave me feedback on my introduction, which originally, because this book, um, it, it's, it's, I'm not the person to write an academic book on refugees. We need more studies, we need more good books, but that isn't my strength. My strength is a humanitarian worker, an activist, and a teacher. I think I know a fair amount. And somebody said to me, I'll be, and I asked for five or six people who were honest. Aaron was one of my readers. It was, it was great. And this woman I know said, Lee, your introduction is like, I've heard you speak. Your introduction is so boring. It's like hearing a lecture. Start with who you are and what brings you to this. So I reshaped it. And then ultimately you get an agent. I got lucky enough to get an agent in New York and a publisher. But from the moment the publisher accepts it, I never believe what it takes so long. It takes a year until the book arrives in the mail. It's a tremendous effort. And just and this is me personally. Every writer, every author, he or she, they deserve to make money from their efforts. For me, in this particular case, I may do another book on another subject that could be different. I can't make money off these eleven people and their story. I can't do it. But all the proceeds from the sale of the book is going to two. Uh, national refugee resettlement organizations, HIAS and International Rescue Committee, IRC, both do a lot of resettlement of refugees in the Bay Area, both do great work, and that's where the money is going. Um, but it was um, a long journey because often I had to re interview, often I had to think about things. So it was a lot of reflection, writing, talking, and always respecting. And it, there's like a mistake, and I'll just say, I'm not going to tell you what it is. There's a mistake in the book with one of the names. I'm not blaming what it is. It's my bad. I, I had to go through a translator. So this is someone who doesn't speak English that well. I profoundly apologized. I kept it simple. I feel terrible. The mistake is there. She accepted my apology graciously. Because after what these people have lived through, and in the second edition, God willing, which I think is coming soon, it will be corrected. But it's also, I felt horrible because your name is Zoe. Uh, how would you like it if I said, well, I want to tell you, I want to tell you now about Susie's question tonight. Now, it wouldn't matter that much. It's just a gathering on an evening, which you're thinking about the day of the how soon is we're going to end five minutes early. But um, it, names are important. I was, I went through a lot to keep that. It's their story. And especially when I highlighted their words, they needed to sign off on um, Rabbi Camille, I know you have a question. I do. Can you go? Yes, please. So I'm wearing my queering religion professor hat, and it's different than my yarmulke, which is here. <clears throat> um, the hat has the letters NCLR on it, which stands for the National Council of Lesbian Rights. My mother used to say, can you take that hat off with the National Convention of Lesbian Refugees? And I thought about that tonight because as I was trying to listen to you, I thought, the students in my class, they're Americans, many of them born here. 
and yet they're refugees in their own families because of being lesbian or gay or transgender or intersex. So what from the stories, I, I think hope, resilience, and courage, but can, can you speak to the crisis of being ourselves and homeless in our homeland? It's a, a, a great question. I want to say a few things about that. In the East Bay particularly, and it's wonderful, a number of gay and lesbian refugees have been resettled here, and this organization called Jewish Family Service is doing great work in the Oakland area, Berkeley area, because one of the issues we're facing is just we saw this with the Rwanda community, the South Sudanese community, or Ford community. Refugees can't stay in this area, they can't afford it, so they're moving out, way out, or Sacramento, or wherever, but in out, not in Berkeley or Oakland, but there is a resettlement. Oakland, where Maryland lives, has a lot of Eritrean refugees. But you ask a deeper question, and what's interesting, and I probably haven't met it this week, so in the Jewish newspaper here, which um, I don't know how many of you know, Gabriel, the former the editor of the, the USA Park, the, he was the last year's editor, two years ago, the editor of the Park. Oh, no, last year, the editor of the Foghorn, uh, now working uh, with a newspaper here in town, doing great work. Um, they published an article of mine about finding the refugee within, especially as we get ready for the Jewish New Year. Rabbi Camille brought a shofar here, which when we sound that on the New Year on Rosh Hashanah, it is to awaken us out of our slumber to find who, who has lead really. Not, not really who you are, but who am I? What's the core of my identity? And what I write about in there is the following. On the superficial level, we have very little in the world, right? We've been through these traumas and other traumas of your life, and refugee camps, and everything I know, about you, right? And my life is different. I've had my own stuff. So, on a superficial level, we have differences. But if you dig deeper, like you're asking to me, what is the life experience about? It's about loss. So, I don't want to overly romanticize it because not everyone in this room had this experience. But again, I generalize and follow it. Of an idyllic youth. I look at my grandchildren, three and four years old. They know nothing of world problems. They're not asking the meaning of life. They're asking when can they play with their truck? When can they go out? We all lose that, right? We're, there's no play structures here. You're not on slides and, and swings. Um, we lose sort of the safety of home. And I say that mindful that not everyone's home was safe. It's the world we live in. But there, for many people, there was a safety of home. And then, by the way, I know it seems remote now, because you're dealing with the pressures of being an undergraduate, of being here and all that. One day you'll say, I yearned for those days back at USF when I was a college student, and I had time, and I could do this and that, and maybe I had to work a job or two, but now, oh, I got all this pressure, and I have a partner in life, and I have a job, and I do something, and I have these tough issues and disease and whatever. Life as a human being is about loss. And where I think the deep connection comes to me is looking at the losses we experience and not dwelling in the past. Because it would be easy, right, to just be in an apartment and be depressed of all you've lost, right? Of all that's behind you, especially when you reach a certain age. You have grandmothers or grandfathers, you may know people in their 90s. What do they often do? Tell stories over and over and over. They want to be heard. So to me, the connection is... It has to start with my saying, where's the refugee in me? What have, I, what have I lost in my life? How do I relate to the narrative in a very real way? And maybe only then can we have more compassion and empathy for those who are really on the journey as refugees in life. But I think we all are in that like, so if any of you want to look at it, what's the, uh, how do you find the internet? I mean, it's the j.com or what's jweekly.com. Jweekly, so just jweekly.com. You put my name in Lee by Cell and you'll see my article. Yeah, is that, is that, is that answer? But it's a great question. That's a lot of what I think about. Yes, please. What's your name? I'm Philip Lee Gebert. Oh, how are you? I'm Chris, thank you for your talk. So yeah, I'm nice to meet you. I was Marion's master's thesis assignment. Yes. And what he wrote about in his thesis, I don't know if you looked at it in your background I did. research, he talked about interruptions with this concept. And that as a refugee, 
when you achieve a settlement, you don't actually make it to this shining light on a hill, and the tragedy isn't necessarily over, the difficulty is not necessarily over. That you're constantly, you're, you're trying to establish your local life here, or wherever you happen to resettle, and you're also constantly drawn back to your home, to your mother, to your cousin, to your sibling, to everyone else who's trying to flee, to cross the Mediterranean, getting these emergency phone calls, being asked for help. And so I'm curious, in your framing, if you think that there's a danger if we don't address that side of the coin, right? So the continuing difficulty, but the persecution isn't necessarily over, the displacement isn't necessarily over, the racism isn't necessarily over. Um, but I just want to push you past, right, the hope, because there is a bigger story there, and I wonder if you can speak to that. It's a great question. Uh, I hope that you and I can have coffee one day and talk more about your work, and because I've heard about you from Marin and other students too. But a life being interrupted and how you live with the past and a history. Just like us, but so many refugees like Marin and everyone in the book and thousands and millions of other people have gone through horrific trauma. So I was thinking about this. Next week I'll be at University of Virginia in Charlottesville speaking at the School of Leadership there, but also the medical school because they want to know as medical students about refugees they're gonna be seeing, and there are a number of refugees in Charlottesville. At the core of what I'm gonna talk about there is the ongoing trauma, and how you make some deal with trauma in a healthy way, and some are just paralyzed by trauma. Just like some of you in this room have suffered trauma and have chosen to be able to go on, some of you have a harder time. I think this life being interrupted and that, so I think of Dane Djokovic. So that's, uh, he lives in Michigan. Uh, he was a lost boy of Sudan. Those are the bo lost boys that walked a thousand miles, okay? What does he talk about? It goes right to your point. He gets here to the States. He's in San Jose, and he's dark black. I mean, he's a black man in America. He's not South Sudanese. He's walking home from one of his jobs in San Jose, and that's the, this is the title of his chapter. And a guy, two guys in a car pull over and say, um, let's give you a ride. Well, Dane loves to walk. I mean, after walking a thousand miles, I guess he liked walking everywhere. So he would walk from work to home. He said, no, thank you. He's, he's big, he's 6'2", 6 6'3", 6 uh, but he's one of the kindest people you ever meet. And then they said, uh, hey, what's wrong with you? And then they used racist terms, which he had never heard before. It's like suddenly he's part of a community he never knew he was part of, right? That he's identifying that day. And then they pull up, and the guy in the passenger seat gets out, and he dumps garbage on Dane's head. Dane went back to his apartment and cried, and wished he could go back to the refugee camp. He didn't, because he decided to stay on. But I think when we talk about the refugee community, and that's why I love the individual stories, there's trauma, there's a life interrupted. There's all that that goes on in a refugee's mind constantly. Like Sidonia's advice, which may seem to us ridiculous, but I used to ask people in my in Holocaust and Genocide, I still would ask it. How many of you keep money in a safe place at home for an emergency or something? How, how many of you do? I'm just curious. You don't have to give me your address or anything. No. Uh, so some of us do. But Aaron, like when you were growing up 100 years ago, did your parents keep money in a safe place? So many, I think, of that generation did, because they, were, they lived with that. But you touch upon, and it's been written about, more has to be written about, and there what I would tell you, and you know this well, that you teach this stuff and your great work at human rights, but it's the following. We provide great services for refugees in the first six months they're in the States. Great is the wrong word. Good services. Basic services. Get people on medical programs. Get them in kids in schools try to get people jobs. After that, with all the cuts going on, a lot of people are out there lost, needing better social services, needing therapists, needing places where like this agency, Syria, do you know Syria and Oakland at all? And, and, and places like that, which is it's kind of a social center and a therapeutic center, but, and there, for me, the takeaway is that we need to be, I mean, that's where, look, what's the ultimate tension, my friends? How do you have a country, every country has a right to secure borders, but how do you balance that with being humane and compassionate 
and living in a global village of 2019 and wanting to welcome people in need. That's the tension, and our politicians give us no answers. They give us rhetoric. We've had great programs in front of the Senate and Congress. They've been rejected. Somehow, I think this is a problem that can be resolved, but we need to start listening, we need to start understanding, and we now need to stop demonizing these people who don't want to be pitied. I've never met a refugee who's looking for pity. I've never met a refugee, but to be acknowledged for their story, to be acknowledged for their courage, to be acknowledged, and you and I both know Marin well, there's a lot of pain there. And I think that's a lens into every refugee I know. There's deep pain, but the ones we know are able to go on. There's all those others who st stay in those apartment buildings. So I'm mindful of the time. I want to let you out a little bit early. You've been so great. I want to leave you with this. And I'm thankful to USF, the SWIG program, to Aaron, for allowing me the time off from teaching to write this book, to do it, and now to be out talking about it this year. My, I, I'm happy to give you my card with my web. My website is simple, refugeesinamerica.com. I'll be writing more and more about these issues and people I meet. But I want you to go home tonight and think about the following. What, is the, what are the values of hope, courage, and resilience mean in your life? What are you hopeful about? And if you find you don't feel that hopeful because of the social reality of our world, how do you rekindle that hope? Where does your courage show up? In what ways are you resilient? How do we better embrace, as Rabbi Camille asked brilliantly, our own refugeeness, our own trauma, so that we can better have empathy and compassion for those who have suffered the worst travails that a human being can ever suffer that are unimaginable on this earth, that we can maybe extend a hand that this country was founded on, of welcoming the stranger, of showing respect and courtesy. My friends, this is an issue we can grapple with at many deep levels. But it starts with by looking, and I can, you're professors, you have great faculty in all these different departments. There's lots of ways of being involved. I really thank you for coming tonight, and, and I know more than the extra credit, it's a lot of time. I hope you got something out from it. I hope you'll think of, if you want to see the pictures of all 11, if you go to refugeesinamerica.com, there's a beautiful photo. But think of, this, think of Sidonia, where dad went to get her an apple. And yet she goes on with such courage. I thank you all, I wish you a good semester, and I hope to see you again. So, just to say, this is the instrument called the uh, shofar, it's a ram's horn, and it's blown every day in the month of Elul that leads to the Rosh Hashanah, the new Jewish year. And Lee, I would say that you have been a living shofar, that you have sounded for us through the, telling these stories, a call, uh, a, a, a calling us to be agents of transformation in other people's lives. So. If you can stand and open yourself to the sound, this primal sound, animal sound, calling us to be our best selves and use all of our strengths and our gifts and our blessings to be sources of change and risk and courage, please rise.